Hi, John Kelly. I'm standing on the banks of the Connecticut River in Long Meadow, Massachusetts. Where? 345 years ago, March 26, 1676, a group of settlers were ambushed by a band of Indians while walking to church from Long Meadow to Springfield. Two settlers were killed and four were captured. Now, before we explore that particular day in more detail, let's first give a little background on the events that led up to that fateful day. So let's start with the King Philip War, also known as the First Indian War. Now that took place in the New England area from 1675 to 1676. It was a Native American's last ditch effort to avoid recognizing English authority and stop the English settlements on their native lands. What initially started in Central Mass gradually made its way to the Connecticut River Valley, arriving on the doorsteps of Springfield Mass on October 5th 1675. The war was by this time well begun throughout the two colonies. The upper settlements of the Connecticut seemed to be at the mercy of the savages. They were now gathering in the neighborhood of Hadley, which apparently was to be the next point of attack. It was to Hadley, therefore, that the English soldiers were sent. Major Pinson believed that some troops should nevertheless be left in the other settlements for fear of a surprise. But the commissioners of the counties made the mistake of not taking his advice. In another respect, he was overruled. With his usual foresight and knowledge of Indian character, he had suggested that the Agawams should be deprived of their firearms and a permanent guard placed in their fort. They were as yet peaceable and being few in number, it could have been easily done. But he was obliged to content himself with taking a few hostages who were then sent by him to Hartford for safer keeping. The gathering of troops at Hadley, of course, required Major Pynchon's presence there as commander of the army in the valley. And in accordance with orders, he felt obliged to take with him nearly all the able-bodied men. Scarcely any men were left in the town except for a few old men like Deacon Chapin, who by then was in his late sickness, and the boys under 18. Springfield's defenseless condition and importance gave Philip his opportunity. Through spies, he knew what was going on. The blow was not to fall on Hadley, after all. To join forces with the Agawams in the Long Hill Stockade was easy. He had only to hurry his light-footed braves down the line of the desolate Wilbraham Hills, and no one would be the wiser till it was too late. On Monday, October 4th, Major Pynchon set out for Hadley with his men. His object was to locate the Indians harboring around there and bring on a decisive battle at once. Meantime, Indian braves who had fired Brookfield and other places were secretly got into the Long Hill Fort. The Agawam hostages were still in Hartford and their relatives probably insisted on their relief from certain death by getting them out of the hands of the whites before the expected attack. Accordingly, some messengers were sent to Hartford who in some way affected the escape of the hostages. In passing through Windsor, either going or coming, the messengers or the hostages happened to come across Toto, an Indian who lived in a white family. Toto became aware of the plot and as he showed great excitement about something, he revealed it on being questioned. No time was to be lost. The fate of Springfield now hung on a family in Windsor, whose name we'd be glad to know. A swift messenger was dispatched to the doomed town, leaving his horse probably in West Springfield and arousing the citizens there. He crossed on the ferry with some of the men at the dead of night. The alarm was given all down the street and the people fled at once to the fortified houses and a messenger was sent to Hadley after major pension. It is probable that the Indians intended to make the attack at night. The betrayal of their plot and the sudden rush of the people for safety may have disconcerted their plans. At all events, the morning broke with no sign of danger and some of the people went back to their homes. It was hard for them to believe that the Agwams had become their enemies. It is true that with the coming of the morning of that eventful day, the people have returned to their homes. Most of them, of course, were women and children and the distress and anxiety must have been great. The defenders of the town had gone, and although sent for, they might be unable to return. There were reports of strange Indians seen about the fort, and another night of death and destruction might be upon the village. At some hazard, Lieutenant Cooper determined to resolve all the doubts. Taking Thomas Miller with him, both mounted, they rode down the street in the direction of the fort. They arrived at some point not 
far from the bridge at Mill River. Shots were heard, and then another. Miller was instantly killed. Cooper fell from his horse, but remounted, started up the street. Mortally wounded, he managed to hang in the saddle. How long can he hold on, given his wounds? If he can only make it to his friend Jonathan Burke's fortified home, present day Elmwood in Maine. Just a few more yards, he finally arrives. Thomas Cooper pulls up to the stoop, falls from his horse, dead. The durful yell, so loud, so wild, so shrill, so clear, as if the fiends of hell burst from the wildwood depths were here. As compared with an Indian war whoop, the howling of a wolf or the cry of the panther had no terror to the forefathers. At the head of the savage band were Philip's chosen braves, closely followed by the more timid agroms armed with firearms, bows, and arrows. Some carried blazing pine knots prepared to burn the houses, barns, and haystacks. In a short time, the whole town from the mill on Mill River to Upper Ferry Lane, Cypress Street, was a burning, smoking ruin. Nothing escaped but the garrison houses, the meeting house, and one or two houses near it. Now, following the sacking of Springfield, Longmeadow, and for that matter, the whole Connecticut River Valley were afraid to venture too far from their homes, isolating the community in Longmeadow from their neighbors in Springfield. The winter of 1675-1676 was a winter of fear and isolation. So what do you say we go back in time to this very spot on the Connecticut River, March 26, 1676? With the coming of spring, Longmeadow folk gradually ventured out again. And on Sunday, the 26th of March, some of the people of Longmeadow, men, women, and children, ventured out to ride to Springfield to attend public worship in the company of several colonial troopers. John Keep's wife, Sarah, had given birth to a baby boy, Jabez, on December 11th, 1675. They were looking forward to his baptism at the first services in many months since the Indian attack on Springfield five months earlier. Through the streets of the hamlet, they passed the last house, the home of Benjamin Cooley, and hurried on through the fearsome narrow pass. Just as they approached the bridge over the Pekasek, shots rang out. Near Bacasic Brook, seven or eight Indians in the bushes fired upon the hindermost and killed a man and a maid, wounded others, and took two women with their babes. Meanwhile, the militia, hearing gunshots and fearing a massive Indian attack, the entire mounted militia and the churchgoers bolted for Springfield to drop off the women and children before returning to the attack site. Meanwhile, the two captured women with their babes were being led deep into the wilderness interior. And back at Court Square, the militia is mounted and ready for pursuit. But time is not on their side. Our destination, Pecosic Brook, as it flows into the Connecticut River in Springfield, Massachusetts. We're on the morning of March 26, 1676, Eight Indians assaulted 18 men besides the women and children as they were traveling to Springfield from Longmeadow for Sunday services. Let's see if we can pinpoint the exact location of the ambush site. The Longmeadow Road ended at the narrow pass just easterly of Pekasek where the valley widens. There, the hill fell so abruptly to the river that the road from Springfield to Longmeadow from a necessity was at the very bank of the river. Another document pertaining to the Pekasek, quote, So limited was the area that the grant was made with the provision that the highway should always be allowed for whatever the river may eat out. We also have the writings of Benjamin Cooley. Early Springfield and Longmeadow, Massachusetts. In many New England towns, building construction was strongly influenced by an abundance of stone. But in Springfield, it was equally influenced by an utter lack of it. One exception is the red sandstone in the bed of the Mill River and at Pekasek. The red sandstone at Pekasek, in my opinion, was most likely removed during the construction of the railroad in 1845. But there are still remnants of the red sandstone ledges behind the old mill building adjacent to the Mill River. Let's take a look. 
I think it's safe to say that the ledges at Bacasic would have looked very similar to the ledges here at the present day Mill River. February 10th, 1652, the selectmen gave to Roland Thomas liberty to carry away those stones he hath dug in the Pecosic River by the end of June next. No man to molest him in the meantime, but in case he leave any after that time, it shall be free for any man to take them. We return to Pecosic Brook, site of the massacre. Last weekend, I covered a large swath of land searching for possible remnants of the red sandstone ledge deposits that had once been abundant at the site. I think it's safe to say that these remnants fit the description. Next, the background history of the early settlers of Longmeadow, Massachusetts. Hi, once again, my name is John Kelly. Welcome to part two of the history of Longmeadow, Massachusetts and the Keep Family Massacre, 1676. Now, if you haven't watched part one, I highly recommend you do that before watching part two. And with that, let's get started. The first settlements of Springfield and eventually Longmeadow were settled along the Connecticut River. Traveling by water was preferred by traveling by land. Actually, all of the settlements from Hartford to Deerfield were located in the fertile plains along the Connecticut River Valley. The criteria for an ideal English settlement there were two things, good drinking water and cleared land ready for the plow. And thanks to the Native Americans' previous centuries of farming in the Connecticut River Valley, all of the colonists' needs were met. Three centuries ago, corn farming Indians were outproducing European wheat farmers. Corns, beans, and squash, also known as the Three Sisters, was the principal crop and had been planted together at least 300 years before the Europeans had arrived. I think it's safe to say that the floodplains adjacent to the Connecticut River and Longmeadow had, been, had continuously produced crops for over 600 years. At a town meeting held May 1st, 1645, it was ordered that Eliza Holyoke, Thomas Merrick, Francis Ball, and Thomas Stebbin should speedily take a view of the Long Meadow and the other grounds they shall meet for future distribution. The Birth of Long Meadow. Now it's important to note that the original town plot is not the present day Route 5 Long Meadow Road, but actually at the Long Meadow Flats, present day Pond Side Road. Before us, a map of the Long Meadow in the 17th century after the removal to the hill in the 18th century. Now, to our right, orange represents present day Route 5 Long Meadow Street. And to the left, present day Pond Side Road that was completed in 1645. Now, you're probably asking yourself, how could it be that a road system that was built over 380 years ago could possibly still exist today in its entirety at the exact same location? Both the Indians and the English selected sites for villages with the same characteristics in mind. Good drinking water, cleared land for planting, and consequently, the English settlements occupied the sites of former Indian towns. Now, at first, the English traveled on foot, as had the Indians. But as horses became available, trails became bridle paths and were widened. Eventually, wheeled vehicles were introduced for inter-village travel. And as the traffic increased, the old footpaths were again widened to permit their use. As farms, houses, and buildings appeared by the road, resistance to any changes in the road were stiffened. This situation tended to maintain the status quo of the early network of roads. After all, what farmer would welcome a new piece of road that cut through his cultivated fields or pastures? Who was willing to have his land cut in two simply to straighten a road? So who exactly was John Keep and the Keep family? With that, I was very fortunate to speak with Patrick Duquette, who had by far done the most extensive research on this very subject. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Duquette. Duquette. Hey John, glad to see you. I feel like talking today and you know how much I love uh, history and 
let's get to it. Um, I didn't know anything about John Keep except for one little item that was in a history book. It said the family was on the way to church from Longmeadow to Springfield and they were attacked by Indians. And that was all I knew. So I started looking into it and I had felt there had to be more to this story than they shared in the history books. And it wasn't something that you could easily find. I talked to a few of his descendants and they didn't know much more than me. They said like little tidbits like, well, the son uh, raised pigs or something like that. So I was determined to get to the bottom of the story. And before I know it, I had page after page after page of historical fact. And um, I guess we might as well start on how he got over here and why. John Keep was um, one of the people that wanted to have a free England. They wanted to not have a king. They were tired of the monarchy and it started a civil war. Most people came here because they just wanted to get away from the civil war. John Keep had to go for his own health. There was a warrant out for his arrest from the uh, Earl of Strafford. So he took the next boat to the United, uh, to America, to America. He ended up in Massachusetts in 1640, but we have no written record for the next 20 years until he purchased some land in Longmeadow. And he asked to be established in the city of Springfield. Well, it actually was a village at the time. They had a rule where you could stay in Springfield for 30 days. And then at the end of the 30 days, the, the consul or the group that was running the city decided yay or nay to keep you. In, and they did decided to keep John. And that was the first written record. They had a meeting and they said, they were definitely going to keep him. And before you know it, he had three different jobs. One of them was Hayward and Fence Viewer. And it sounds like Fence Viewer is kind of a boring job, but it isn't because the settlers' cattle used to break out of the, the pastures all the time. And when they broke out, that means they were trampling the Native Americans' corn. And that got the Native Americans into court because they would always complaining about the cat, cattle stampeding. So the town established uh, a fine for not having your fence in place and straight and strong. And John Keep was the guy that had to uh, manage that. Well, let's move on a little bit. John established himself and before you know it, he, he bought a parcel of land, Longmeadow. They called it, um, the Indians called it Masasic or Masasic and that's got him started. He got this biggest parcel was near Freshwater Brook and it extended to um, what we know as Enfield, Connecticut. Let's head down to the Longmeadow Flats and see if we can retrace the steps that John Keep and his family had traveled on their way to church on that fateful morning of March 26, 1676. Before us, the Keep family's five acre plot of land high on the bluff overlooking Freshwater a.k.a. Raspberry Brook, near the Massachusetts-Connecticut line. This is going to be fun. Let's take a walk and retrace the steps that John Keep and his family had taken on that fateful morning, March 26, 1676. Here is my present location, and we'll be traveling north. Today's date, March 26th and exactly 346 years had passed since that fateful morning. The current time, 7 a.m. I imagine John Keep and his family were already on the road, so to speak, for they lived the furthest from Sunday services, a distance of over seven and a half miles. Little word of advice, when traveling the flats of Longmeadow in the spring, wear a good pair of boots. Now these conditions would have been mild compared to the travel in the 17th century for the deep ruts created by the wagon wheel, cattle and horses, especially in the springtime, would have made travel close to impossible. Not to mention the bone jarring experience of travel on a two wheeled cart pulled by a team of oxen with absolutely 
no suspension. According to records, this original road, which was first laid out in 1645, was a two-lane highway with the width of approximately two rods, which translates to about 33 feet in width. So the road before us would have been a two-lane, deeply rutted, muddy mess traveling north and south. Before us, a view from my drone as we travel north down the old Longmeadow Road. Down below, the corner of Long Pond Road in Bark Hall, 2022. Long Pond in Bark Hall, 1645. With Springfield in the background, we continue our travel down the old road to Springfield. I'm sure the authorities had set a time in place to meet before they, quote, hurried on through the fearsome narrow pass. My guess is here on the corner of Emerson and Long Pond. I superimposed present-day Long Meadow with the 1645 map. And to get your bearings, these buildings on the right is the Long Meadow Recycle Center on the corner of Emerson and Long Pond Road. With Captain John Whipple's 18 mounted militia, trailed by an estimated 20 parishioners traveling on ox carts, I imagine the column would have stretched a good distance along the road adjacent to the planting fields. We travel further parallel to the railroad tracks heading north on the old road to Springfield. We're back on the two-lane muddy mess. A few hundred yards to go before we arrive at former Benjamin Cooley's 17-acre homestead. My current location, just about here. And here we are. To my left, Cooley Brook flowing west to the Connecticut River. And to my right, Benjamin Cooley's 17-acre parcel of land. This most likely would have been the view from the road of Benjamin Cooley's home. The houses built by the first settlers were small, single-roomed homes. The furniture would be sparse, maybe a bench or two to sit on, small tables, some chests where they could store their various items. Inside the single room, the fireplace used for cooking and to keep the house warm through the dark, cold winter months. I think it's safe to say that the Cooley family had stoked the fire, so to speak, and had breakfast ready as the Prussianers passed his home at the estimated time of 8 a.m. And I can also bet that the Cooley family gave a big wave as the column passed their home to, heading to Sunday services. And here we are. From the Cooley homestead, we head north to the, quote, fearsome narrow pass. Interesting, this natural geologic feature, this ridge line, the hill, ends at Pekasik Brook, creating the narrow gap. It was a triangular piece of land, the point of which intruded itself into the narrow pass. So limited was the area that the grant was made with the provisions that the highway should always be allowed for whatever the river may eat out. I'm at the location where the land starts to narrow, about 150 yards from Pekasek Brook. To the right, it's evident that the soil was moved to make way for the railroad tracks that were first laid in 1838. Let's head down to the shoreline. The Native Americans' best weapon was the element of surprise. For years, the Native Americans would terrorize the colonists with their surprise at ambush and attacks. Quote, they come like foxes through the woods, which afford them concealment. They attack like lions as they surprise are made when they are least expected. They take flight like birds, disappearing before they had really appeared. To the left, the Connecticut River. To the right, the steep red rock embankment. An ideal ambush site. Just about a hundred yards to go before we cross the Pekasik. So what do you say we go back in time? This very spot, this very day, this very moment. 
With the coming of spring, Long Meadow folk gradually ventured out again. And on Sunday, the 26th of March, some of the people of Long Meadow, men, women, and children, ventured out to ride to Springfield to attend public worship in the company of several colonial troopers. John Keep's wife, Sarah, had given birth to a baby boy, Jabez, on December 11th, 1675. They were looking forward to his baptism at the first services in many months since the Indian attack on Springfield five months earlier. Through the streets of the hamlet, they passed the last house, the home of Benjamin Cooley, and hurried on through the fearsome narrow pass. Just as they approached the bridge over the Pecosic, shots rang out. Near Pecosic Brook, seven or eight Indians in the bushes fired upon the hindermost and killed a man and a maid, wounded others, and took two women with their babes. Meanwhile, the militia, hearing gunshots and fearing a massive Indian attack, the entire mounted militia and the churchgoers bolted for Springfield to drop off the women and children before returning to the attack site. Meanwhile, the two captured women with their babes were being led deep into the wilderness interior. And back at Court Square, the militia is mounted and ready for pursuit. But time is not on their side. First stop, the bridge that crosses the Pecosic Brook. Let's get back to the location of the ambush. It was a triangular piece of land, the point of which intruded itself into the narrow pass. So limited was the area that the grant was made with the provisions that the highway should always be allowed for whatever the river may eat out. Today, the railroad tracks completely occupy the restricted area. It was an ideal ambush point, and there is where John Keep was slain in 1676. Pecosic Brook, March 26, 2022. Pecosic Brook, March 26, 1676 where the war party had most likely gathered before their surprise attack on the unsuspecting party of churchgoers. We're back with Patrick Duquette. I asked for his thoughts on what exactly happened in the first moments of the attack. And it was probably 16 or 18 people from Long Meadow, and they gave them an escort of 18 or 20 militia mounted on horses. But the militia was all in front of the people that were going to church. They did not put a rear guard on this column, even though they know there was Indian activity in the state. They followed a trail along the river, the Connecticut River, and it got to its narrowest point and there was a, a new wooden bridge built there. And it was the tightest area in the location. The groups crossed, find the last two families was was John Keep and his wife on a horse and another family had a, a cart his wife and baby were in a cart they were the very last soon as they got to the bridge all hell broke loose and seven or eight Indians let loose on them John Keep and the man were killed right then and there the brave militia bolted towards Springfield, not turning around to see what the gunfire was. As soon as they heard the first shot, they galloped with all the other people and they said, oh, we want to get the other people safe, but they didn't want to have anything to do with um, marauding Indians. By the time they dropped everybody off in Springfield and came back, the only thing there was John Keep dead on the ground and the other man whose name never got into the history books. Thanks for watching and part three is coming soon.